statement uh, one nine uh, is where we will look at uh, for today. Uh, so, so here in this um, part, the last few statements in this one, um, and you know, the next uh, one ten, uh, one eleven. Uh, up to 111, these few statements, four or five of these statements, um, the, the historical context is that um, there were various uh, debates going on uh, among all the different uh, teachers with different backgrounds, with different education, uh, debates going around as to um, you know, where things should go. In other words, you know, classification debates. Yeah? Should, they, should this be classified as a sutra teaching or a tantra teaching? And then within sutra, you know, should this be the first turning or the second or the third? Should this be here or should this be there? And so there's a lot of these debates. And the debates are conducted on various levels. You know, sometimes it's not most of the time it's not even two people debating. Right? It's just somebody writes something, then somebody you know, later responds to something. And sometimes it's within the same communi community, different people having different opinions. And so then, of course, there's also a very systematic way of uh, discussing and debating uh, that was going on in like what you would call the seminaries, uh, the, the Buddhist study centers in Tibet during that time, including during the time of Gyoba Rinpoche. So in part, these statements is Gyoba Rinpoche kind of responding. You can almost imagine, right, that first of all, he wasn't going to these seminaries to, to take part in these like systematic debates and the production of systematic philosophy. So I think it's good for us to think in these terms. There's systematic debates and systematic philosophy, then there is more impromptu debate, so to say, and impromptu and, and much more natural arising of philosophical standpoints. But there is much more kind of like uh, in the context of teacher and student talking, you know, rather than two people uh, trying to convince the other person about this or that matter. So I think there are two ways, you know, things were happening. So I would say most of Gyoba Rinpoche's uh, material is of the second type, you know, much more him you know, giving instructions to his students. And you could say, you know, these students more or less, you know, trust him. And now, of course, you know, they might have some doubts that they want to clarify, but they usually don't come, huh? these don't usually record of someone coming to challenge him. There were those as well. Uh, in fact, one of his main disciples, Ngoje Repa, um, was trained in the Sakya system and was an important, uh, promising figure uh, in the Sakya system. Uh, and he heard of the reputation of Gyoba Rinpoche, uh, and in particular about how so many people have gathered to go study with him, practice with him. But he also heard probably like, you know, oh, Kyopar Rinpoche's understanding of the Dharma is very sloppy. Sloppy. <laughs> no clear like, you know, this is this, this is this, this is this, you know, from one perspective, it's sloppy. There's no systematic arguments. And so, but then he is annoyed by, you know, like, and then why are so many people following him? So he went yeah, and wanted to debate Gilbert Rinpoche. Uh, long story short, uh, he stayed. <laughs> uh, he did not go back to where he came from. And he stayed and he became one of the key disciples of Gilbert Rinpoche. And it was him who composed this uh, stages of the path teachings uh, called the essence of Mahayana. 
It's called Tekchen, uh, Tekchen, Mahayana, Tekchen, Tekpa Chenpo, Tekchen, Tempe Ningpo. It's essence of the Tempe, essence of the teachings of Mahayana. And that is basically a commentary or a stages of the path for the practice of the fivefold Mahamudra, but organized in a Lamrim style, leading to finally the fivefold Mahamudra practice. So together with Gongchik, Tenning and Gongchik are considered by many in the Dugong as like the quintessential uh, teachings of Kyoba Rinpoche, even though Kyoba Rinpoche himself did not personally uh, compose either of these texts. Uh, but somehow uh, they, they have become uh, respected as you know, quintessential uh, essence of what Kyoba Rinpoche taught. Denning on the one hand, uh, and Gongchik on the other hand. Um, so Tenning uh, will have, uh, uh, was put together by this disciple who previously uh, trained in the Sakya system. Uh, then when he came to Kyoba Rinpoche, uh, he wanted to debate Kyoba Rinpoche. Then, you know, things kind of happened. Uh, Kyoba Rinpoche showed him certain things, certain understandings, and then he realized like, oh my gosh, you know, like this is where I should be, you know, this is how I should be practicing. This is the kind of guide that I need. So he stayed. Yeah. Mm. But for the most part, you know, Kyoba Rinpoche, teachings that he gave, you know, they're not systematic presentation of this or that topic. Uh, they are hard instructions, a pith instructions that were given. Yeah. So including, you know, these statements. Uh, now, of course, when, when Sherab Jungne put these statements together, uh, it is already, you could say, in a skeletal way, uh, in a skeletal way, uh, he was beginning to organize uh, uh, the thought or the, the viewpoint, uh, if you can say that, of Kyopar Rinpoche along certain, uh, aggregating them, putting them along under certain topics. Uh, you, you see that Sherab Jungne, in a way, is starting to provide uh, some kind of structure some kind of framework for understanding uh, Kyoba Rinpoche's teachings uh, in the compiling of the Gongchik statements. Remember that, you know, when Kyoba Rinpoche passed away, part of the funeral ceremonies and ritual that went on for a while, you know, like a, a few months, was also a compiling of the collected works of Kyoba Rinpoche. And I believe that the collected works were completed and the community agreed to, uh, sort of in the same model provided by the historical Buddha uh, when he passed away, uh, right? It said that 500 of his key disciples went into retreat uh, and spent uh, three months, I believe, uh, compiling all the teachings, uh, at the end of which they agreed and said, this is what our teacher taught. So that model has been uh, uh, adopted by many Buddhist communities later on. So when Kyobar Rinpoche passed away, you know, they all came together and they gathered all these teachings and they agreed, okay, these are what we as a whole agree, you know, Kyobar Rinpoche taught. And this is found in his 12th volume, uh, Sungbum. Uh, well, the compilation of the Sungbum is uh, more involved and more complicated than what I just told you. What I just told you is a, a brief kind of summary. But Gongchik itself, came later, at least seven years later, because Sherab Jungne, who oversaw the funeral uh, arrangements and everything, uh, who kind of chaired, uh, led all the ceremonies and led in the effort of compiling all these things, um, he went to retreat uh, in the Kailash area uh, for seven years, uh, more or less. It's only after that period that then he came back to central Tibet and he came back to Dragon. Uh, and even then, only slowly he started to talk about, you know, there's this collection of Vajra statements that I have been um, putting together uh, in the last seven, eight years that I've been in retreat. And this uh, is a distillation uh, in, this, in the most essential 
uh, format what our guru taught. Then only he started to teach this. So there, there is evidence that when he started to teach Gongqi, there were some objections from some of the other senior members of the community. They say, we, we, I don't know, you know, they say, we, this is not, you know, uh, where did you get this, you know? Now, of course, we also trust that, you know, Shirab Jungne was basically Kyoba Rinpoche's Ananda. And so then he heard everything from Kyoba Rinpoche. And so these are kind of taken out, you could say. So I think, you know, I'm confident if you read the 12 volumes of the Sumbum, uh, and maybe now, you know, when they have digitized the Sumbum, um, and if you feed these Vajra statements into a search engine, uh, you could pull out uh, and find out this statement likely came from this teaching. Maybe not the exact words, uh, but the meaning uh, you can find in this teaching. Uh, this Vajra statement, you can find in that teaching. This Vajra statement, you can find in that teaching he gave. This Vajra statement, you can find in that song that he wrote. This Vajra statement, you can find in that prayer that he wrote. So modern technology can be pretty amazing. So let's see if someone good with computers and all that and good in Tibetan, of course, will be able to track down where a particular Vajra statement might have come from, perhaps. Anyway, uh, these few statements that we're looking at now, as I say, uh, Kyoba Rinpoche was addressing uh, some of the hot topics that have that is kind of being debated around. But again, you have to understand, you know, he's not playing by the same rules uh, that 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 these debates uh, are constituted uh, in like seminaries. Instead, you can imagine him maybe overhearing uh, two of his disciples uh, uh, casually, you know, debating uh, some of these or repeating some of these debates that they are hearing. Oh, you know, over there at the Institute of Higher Learning, you know, these monks, they are talking about this, 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 you know, the difference between this turning of the wheel and that turning of the heel. And you can almost imagine Kyoba Rinpoche overhearing that and saying, you know, making a statement like, you know, this is how you should understand it. Huh? Giving sort of like Kyoba Rinpoche, using these as opportunities huh, to bring his students back to huh, meditation. Like, what does this have to mean uh, in terms of experiencing this, in terms of putting this into practice? Why does it matter, you know, to know on the eighth bhumi, yeah, where the bodhisattvas are walking or levitating? <laughs> Sometimes, you know, some of these issues that they're debating, you know, it makes you feel like that, you know, you're like, they're like talking about, you know, on the eighth level, uh, if they're not walking and levitating, uh, are they levitating one inch? Uh, or actually, it's like a third of an inch. And some of us sometimes, you know, when we study this material, we'll get so into it that we even forget, you know. Like to someone who is listening from the side, they're like, really? That's what you're debating? <laughs> I mean, of course, you know, if you know how to debate, you can debate whatever and still clear your afflictive emotions. I believe that. <laughs> you could be debating, you know. Did the chicken come first or did the egg come first? And if you know how to use debate, yeah, that can clear your afflictive emotions. But if you don't know how to debate, if you don't know the purpose of that discussion, you know, and you forget the purpose of Dharma, then yeah, you can really get into, you know, on the eighth level, you know, when bodhisattvas arrive at the eighth level. I remember when I was a lot younger, you know, yeah, these kinds of debates, very exciting, especially growing up in Malaysia, at that point, there's very little writings uh, from the Mahayana, much less Vajrayana tradition that is in English when I was growing up. Uh, all the English material uh, Dharma stuff uh, uh, from the Theravada tradition. Uh, but somehow, you know, being the heretic that I, I'm always, you know, uh, 
uh, even though I started in Theravada, you have always this interest in Mahayana. You know. Then soon when Mahayana translations became available, you know, started reading that. Then I remember as a young man, you know, like very excited about, oh, the difference between our heart and bodhisattvas and this and that, you know, like, oh, this is superior to that. Oh, no, that is more realistic than this and this and that. And, but luckily, I think, yeah, thanks to good karma, perhaps, or the kindness of teachers, mm, I also, you know, f- f- kind of got to understand, you know, like, really? Do I really need to know, you know, our hearts on what level is inferior to bodhisattvas on what level? Or bodhisattvas on what level is superior to our hearts on what level? It's like, on a good day, maybe the mind of refuge in the three jewels is present for about seven and a half minutes. <laughs> On a good day, for about seven and a half minutes, you know, I really take refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha. And that's the best achievement that I have. So does it really matter whether, you know, our hearts on what level or bodhisattvas on what level is superior to what level to what level, right? When the time comes, you know, it will be clear. Pay attention to what's right in front of you, what you need to be training, what we need to know right here. When the texts talk about the superiority of the bodhisattva path and seemingly criticizing uh, the option of um, the Shravaka uh, path, it is not to put down the Shravaka path. First, you have to understand how amazing the Shravaka path is and how profound the realizations of the Shravakas. It's only when you can appreciate that point that then you can even become more impressed when you hear actually even the beginning of the Bodhisattva is superior to all the achievements of the Shravaka path. And with that, you know, you you become very confident that the universal concern of the Mahayana is superior to any kind of wisdom that doesn't take into consideration the welfare of all beings. That then becomes a reminder for ourselves, not a criticism of those who follow Shravaka path, but a reminder to ourselves, you know, if we forget the welfare of others, no matter how profound the wisdom that we say we're working on, it doesn't measure. It doesn't measure one single moment of truly being concerned about the welfare of others. That is what we take to heart. Don't take to heart, you know, the debates. This is better than this. This is better than this. This is better than this. This is not so bad or good, you know. Again, then that get turns into sectarian mind. One nine. The various vehicles teach the Dharma wheel of definitive meaning. So there's some uh, terminology here. Various vehicles. And the Dharma wheel of definitive meaning. So there is the turning of the Dharma wheel of four truths. Right? Then there's the turning of the Dharma wheel of no characteristics. And the turning of the Dharma wheel of definitive meaning. And this is sometimes uh, 
the way in which the three turnings uh, are named. Uh, simply first turning, second turning, third turning. First turning is sometimes also called the first turning of the Dharma wheel, which is the Four Noble Truths. The second turning of the Dharma wheel, which is the teaching of uh, no characteristics. And the third turning of the Dharma wheel, which is the teachings of definitive meaning. So here, Kyoba Rinpoche's statement is, the various yanas, the various vehicles, teach the Dharma wheel of definitive meaning. So this is again, you know, again, you can sort of try to imagine, you know, some of his disciples debating, you know, well, there is the three turnings of the wheel. And then we also have the three yanas. These yanas, right? Does it belong to the first wheel? Like, does the first yana belong to the first wheel? Second yana belong to the second wheel? Third yana belong to the third wheel? Or are these yanas, you know, different, separate, this, that, that? So you can imagine them having these debates, you know, like they've heard other places doing, but this is a retreat place, you know, and Kibar Mache walking into that conversation and he says, the various vehicles, whether you call them the individual liberation vehicle, uh, the Mahayana vehicle, universal vehicle, uh, the uh, indestructible Vajra vehicle, or uh, the Shravaka vehicle, the Pratika vehicle, the Bodhisattva vehicle, because that's that vocabulary too, you know. In the Lotus Sutra, it doesn't talk about Vajrayana. It talks about the, the three yanas in the Lotus Sutra is the Shravaka yana, Prateka yana, and Bodhisattva yana. So various vehicles can also mean those without explicitly talking about secret mantra or Vajrayana vehicle. But Kyabar Rinpoche says, the various vehicles, whatever those different vehicles that you're talking about, they teach definitive meaning. Now, this is in contrast to the general position, which is right above that statement. People often claim that the teachings of the various vehicles are the middle dharma vehicle, the, the middle dharma wheel, which is the dharma wheel of no characteristics, while the absence of characteristics, teachings, reveal the definitive meaning. Now, let's look at the commentary. So, so this, this, okay, before we look at the commentary, so this prevailing view uh, that Sharab Jungne provides here, he's saying that this statement uh, is actually trying to position, um, trying to address, or, or, or not trying, the statement addresses those debates that say, um, the various vehicles are taught in the second turning. And the teaching on the absence of characteristics, which is another way of saying emptiness, those teachings reveal the definitive meaning, which is, or they pertain to the definitive meaning, which is the third turning. So it's kind of some interesting categories being used and mixed here. But let's look at the commentary. Generally, the completely perfected Buddha became a Buddha in the essence of the great sameness of all phenomena and taught the fundamental nature of all sentient beings as emptiness and as cause and effect. So again, we go back to the main theme in Gongshik. Yeah? The fundamental nature 
uh, is the fundamental nature, uh, which is the in no duality, no opposition between emptiness on the one hand and cause and effect on the other hand. Emptiness is she. Uh, cause and effect is bab. She ki neluk, bab ki neluk. Neluk is fundamental nature. So, Chodra says, you know, first, generally, let's remember this. In particular, those who hold the second turning of the wheel to be of definitive meaning, and the final uh, turning Uh, wait, hold on. In particular, those who hold the second Dharma wheel to be of definitive meaning and the final third to be taught in the various vehicles do not analyze properly. Okay, now Chodha is going to address the issue. But it's, it's, it's telling, you know, to me that Chodha says, first you have to understand. Generally, this is what Buddha taught. Now, let's, then he says, now let's address the issue at hand. Through the above quotation of the Sutra, where the Bodhisattva, Paramartha Samudgata, addressed the Buddha, the second wheel, which is the absence of characteristics, have been shown to be the ground for dispute. And the third wheel, being of definitive meaning, have been shown not to be the ground of dispute. And not only that, but also according to the actual meaning, the Buddha has not taught an assessment other than understanding all three wheels to be only of definitive meaning. Why? Because the Buddha did not reach, did not teach in two extremes. He taught emptiness, to redirect those who imagine that nirvana is a substantial thing. And so meaning, in the first turning of the wheel, Buddha talked about the faults of samsara and the qualities of nirvana. So then disciples are encouraged, are inspired to transcend samsara, to be free from samsara. So then they work towards nirvana. But there is now the danger of considering nirvana as a substantial thing. So then therefore, in the second, what we call the second turning, the Buddha taught emptiness to show that even nirvana is insubstantial. Thus, teaching emptiness is the intention of the middle, the second turning. With people in mind who, like some later Tibetans, holding a view according to which the empty is an absolute negation that is something other than the fundamental nature and so on, it is said, if they have a mistaken view concerning emptiness, those with little discriminative knowledge are ruined. So, quoting Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna says, Nagarjuna is the most famous kind of uh, teacher, uh, the teaching emptiness. But even that, uh, Nagarjuna already said in his root text, uh, his main text, uh, those who mistakenly grasp the teaching of emptiness uh, will be ruined, that it is more dangerous to, to miss mistakenly fixate on the teachings of emptiness, then it is uh, to grab uh, a cobra, a poisonous cobra. Uh, Nagarjuna said that. So here, basically, uh, the commentary is saying, there are some who say uh, that the second turning is definitive, first and third is not. Then there are some who say, no, 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 no. Second is not definitive. A third is. 
basically nobody says, yeah, at least nobody in the Tibetan context will say, the first turning is definitive, the other two are not. Uh, where it is debated is the second and the third. So here, uh, this commentary here, it says, the first turning, the Buddha, at that level, Buddha is trying to lead people away from samsara, towards nirvana. Second turning, the Buddha is correcting any side effects of people becoming too obsessed with reaching nirvana, that they turn nirvana now into something substantial. So then he taught emptiness. Pointing out the two views, coming back to the commentary, pointing out the two views of eternalism or essentialism and nihilism as poisonous while teaching the final wheel, the Buddha taught in the manner of freedom from extremes, inseparable union between emptiness and cause and result. Hence, Maitreya Nata says, here you must not remove anything and you must not establish anything at all. Looking perfectly at the perfect state, you will become completely, you will be completely liberated if you see perfectly. I'm quoting Abhisamaya Lankara. So, in the third turning, whatever unintended side effects of teachings of emptiness are also completely done with. Thus and so forth, he has taught infinitely. And that which the Buddha has taught in the Samadhi Raja Sutra, the Akshayamati Sutra, and the Bodhisattva Pitaka of the Ratnakutta is certainly just the same thing. Chodra is saying, here are some sutras where the Buddha taught what's considered definitive meaning, the third turning. Let's pause here to see if you have questions and I will see if I can answer or not. <laughs> I have a question. Uh -huh. um, if, if one completely understands emptiness, mm -hmm. how, how do you go into nihilism if you really understand it? Well, if you really understand it, you won't. You won't. But the dangers of not really understanding it is it leads to nihilism. Okay. And that's what the Buddha is correcting. The Buddha is not correcting what <laughs> perfect understanding. <laughs> yeah, the problem is not <laughs> truly understanding, not correctly understanding. <laughs> Right, unintended side effects of medicine. <laughs> Even this Dharma medicine can create side effects, not just modern pharmaceuticals. <laughs> mm. So vicious um, uh, notes, I think, uh, is going to be helpful. Yeah? So if you don't have 
you know, a question that we really need answered in the reading of the commentary. We, we, we move on to Sobish's notes. I, I feel his notes are really helpful here in this case, especially. Overall, his notes are very helpful for two reasons. One, he brings in material from the earliest commentaries, Rinjangma and Dorshema. And I find those very useful, especially when Chodra has gone off debating people. <laughs> Like part of Chodra's commentary, I already said, without choice. Uh, he, he has to debate because he has to defend the attacks. <laughs> so that part. That part maybe sometimes, you know, we're like, eh, we're not really in that business. So we, 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 we don't want to get involved uh, in that, <laughs> understandably. Uh, so then Sobish provides, you know, notes from Rinjangma and Dorshema. And Rinjangma and Dorshema wasn't written at all uh, to um, defend. So it's not defensive. Uh, it's, it's very useful, uh, prescriptive, uh, without being defensive, just explaining it the way uh, they understood Kyopa Rinpoche to teach. So Dorshema and Rinjangma. So this is the next maybe fantasy hope that within our lifetimes, you know, uh, either Rinjangma or Dorshema can be translated and published. So you all pray for the long life of Sobish. Uh, pray for your own long life, for maybe Sobish to publish either Rinjama or Dorshema translation. If there's anyone who is likely to do it, as far as I know right now, uh, it might be him. But I don't know if he's trying or not. Uh, maybe you all can find this email and say, oh, we've been reading your book, you know. Please, 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 you know. <laughs> Publish either Dorshema or Injangma. Uh, so, the previous points have established in this notes. So here he summarizes, you know, and very helpful here, all the statements that came before. So the previous points have established that all teachings reveal the original state of the fundamental nature. One one are a unity, one two, and that all sutra baskets and tantra sections are one path with one goal, which is one three. So this is a great summary. If you want to know what one one is about, what one two is about, what one three is about, the wheels too, or the turning of the wheel, the turnings of the wheel, are essentially one contain each other, and aim at the same result. Yet, they are three due to people's conceptions, which is statement four to seven. Seen from this perspective of unity and of a single path, all the elements of the teachings and paths taught for sentient beings with different natures, faculties, motivations, and inclinations still aim at the same definitive meaning. That no matter what part the Buddha's intention is still to lead us to understanding the definitive meaning. And that is still Buddha's concern. It's not that Buddha says, you know, you are only ultimately capable of half meaning so I will show you how to arrive at half meaning. You are only ultimately capable, capable of understanding two-thirds meaning. I will lead you to two-thirds meaning. And you over here, you are my favorites. I will take you to definitive complete meaning. No. All, all the elements of the teachings and paths taught for sentient beings with different natures, faculties, motivations, and inclinations still aim at the same definitive meaning. Now, according to the Dorshima, some say that sutras chiefly concerned with cause and result are teaching a meaning that requires further explanation. Hence, the four truths of the noble ones of the first turning require further explanation. Then the sutras that teach all phenomena as emptiness 
are the Dharma wheel of definitive meaning and belong to the second turning. The Dharma wheel of the absence of characteristics consists of the sutras taught in various vehicles, constituting the third turning. According to the Rinjangma, some hold that the first wheel teaches the four truths, the second wheel, the sutras of the various vehicles, various vehicles here. Okay, so here it's talking about Shravaka vehicle, Prateka vehicle, Bodhisattva vehicle. It's not talking about Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana. Okay, so just to be clear, various wheels here, various vehicles here is referring to primarily how the Lotus Sutra talks about the vehicles. Lotus Sutra has a very famous uh, uh, story. I, I may, let me maybe quickly tell that story, then you can appreciate this point. Um, it said that there was a very wealthy uh, businessman uh, who has a big house um, and all his uh, kids live in there. Now, one day, uh, he went on a trade, a uh, business trip. And then when he came back, uh, he uh, saw, he realized that the house is on fire. And this is a very big house. So then he said to the, his children, come out, come out, come out. Uh, and it said that, but the house is so big that they did not, not convince, you know, the kids are so distracted by all the goodies that is in the house uh, that, that the father tried to get them to come out and, and they won't. But the father knows, you know, there's a big fire about to consume the whole house. So then the father devised this thing where he says, you know, oh, I, 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 I just came back from this trip and I, I, I brought along um, these carts, like sort of like toys, like vehicles, carts. He says, you know, I have goat carts, uh, I have... Um, goat carts, uh, I have like horse carts, uh, I have uh, donkey carts, you know, I have mule carts, you know, that you can play with, you know, come out, come out. So then they say, it said that, you know, then when, this, when the kids heard, you know, like, oh, there are all these different carts, i.e. these different vehicles. So, oh, I, I've been dreaming of riding on the goat cart, you know, so all those came out. And then, oh, then those who say, oh, horse, horse cart, you know, I've been thinking, I've been wanting this, you know, all along. So they came out and they came out. And then they said that when they finally all came out, the father said, no, actually, I have the single supreme ox cart, which is the image of the Buddha vehicle, the example of the Buddha vehicle. And he says, and that is the one that will take us away from this fire. And in that way, I said that they were all delivered from danger. So this is what this uh, various vehicles is referring to. So the second wheel, the sutras are the various vehicles and requiring further analysis. Because in the Lotus Sutra, it does say, you know, that this giving of the various vehicles is just a skillful means. That in fact, there's only one, which is the Buddha vehicle. And so according to this, so Rinjangma is reporting, you know, a view that, you know, in some ways corresponds with what the Lotus Sutra is saying. And the third wheel, the Sutra of the absence of characteristics which are of definitive meaning and establish the sameness, the oneness of all phenomena. Okay, now what the Dorshema and the Rinjangma uh, is saying is the prevalent views. So we don't need to spend too much effort to try to understand the logic of these prevailing views because Kyopar Rinpoche will give a statement to address these, uh, these positions. The Dorshema and the Rinjangma also present the view of people who say that the sutras concerning the merchants, Trapasu and Bardapala are the first turning and so on and so forth, okay? 
Then finally, the Dorshema notes that some say that the sutras that teach the existence of the Buddha nature, essence of the Tathagata, have a meaning that requires further interpretation and thus do not belong to the Dharma wheel of definitive meaning. For them, the sutras of the middle wheel are of definitive meaning. These days, you can say generally that's the Galupa view uh, and the Sakyapa view, uh, that the teachings of the perfection of wisdom in the middle turning is definitive. The first and the third, not definitive. Generally, you can say this is the Galupa and Sakyapa position. Okay. So here, Dorshema says, there, there are some so during the composition of Dorshema, there's no Galupa yet, okay? So he's not directly talking about Galupas. Galupas came a few centuries later. But nonetheless, that understanding was already there. Uh, for them, the sutras of the middle wheel are of definitive meaning. These various views are, according to the Drikumpa, mistaken. All, all, all the above positions are mistaken. One reason is that they ascribe the status of definitive truth to the second wheel, or they do not recognize, as does Chikten Sungan, that the Buddha taught the teachings of definitive meaning in all vehicles. So actually, according to Sobich, Chikten Sungan is not going to say the definitive meaning is only found in the second turning, or for that matter, only in the third turning. I would say that today, generally, I think Kagyupas and Nyingma will say, sec uh, second is also not definitive, but third is. And so if you want to draw sectarian lines, you will say, generally speaking, Geluk and Sakya today, they will say second turning is definitive. Then generally, Kagyu and Nyingma will say third is definitive. Some Kagyu and some Nyingma will say second and third are definitive. <laughs> Practically no one will say first is definitive. But here, Chikten Sungan taught Chikin Sungan's understanding is teachings of definitive meaning is in all vehicles. So Sobish continues, all our commentaries make the point that if one investigates from a perspective of gradual wheels alone, the third wheel must be categorized as definitive meaning. So meaning that in the commentary, it is not saying the commentaries recognize that from certain perspective, you can say certain things. But underlying such a model based on the idea that the retinues are different, there's also a more basic understanding, which is all teachings, baskets, sections, and wheels are but one path and one vehicle. Such a single vehicle aims only at the fundamental nature or aims only at revealing, at teaching the fundamental nature, which belongs to the sphere of the definitive meaning. Thus, even though the individuals have different realizations, natures, faculties, motivations, and inclinations, and even though the teachings of the wheels take that into account to guide them, all the teachings have the same intention and always aim at the definitive meaning. This topic will be dealt with also in the next budget statement. So Choki Drakpa rejects the preference of the second wheel over the third by accrediting definitive meaning to it. Since the Bodhisattva Paramartha Samutkata had stated in the Sandhya Nirmochana Sutra, 
that it was the ground for dispute, whereas the third wheel was not. This is, however, only acceptable from the perspective of a gradual arrangement of the wheels, since in truth, all three wheels are of definitive meaning. Following Nagarjuna, emptiness was chiefly taught in the second wheel to refute Nirvana as a thing. Some later Tibetans, however, probably the followers of Prasangika Madhyamaka in Tibet, maintain a version of emptiness involving the idea of an absolute negation. This is unacceptable because of its limitation to an extreme view where the empty is, and by way of such radical maneuver, different from the fundamental nature. In other words, by establishing emptiness through an absolute or non-implicative, non-implicative negation, they are trapped in nihilism. Emptiness as taught in the final vehicle, however, is free from extremes, an inseparable union, and cause and result. The fundamental nature is not nothing, but it is, as Maitreyanata stated in the Abhisamaya Lankara, something where nothing is to be removed or established. By looking perfectly at the perfect state, you will be be completely liberated if you see perfectly. This theme we have seen already. Yeah? Uh, this is nothing new. So one nine is another instance yeah, where, as I say, you know, probably Kyobarampache, you know, stumbled upon or walked by where a debate of, you know, is it the second wheel? Is it the third wheel? Is it the first wheel? Or, you know, most people don't debate the first wheel eh? because they all say, oh, that's, that's Hinayana stuff, right? Uh, Buddhism for dummies. But Gilbert Rinpoche, in fact, as we will see more and more, he really places emphasis on the first turning. But even that, he will not say, oh, a first turning is definitive, second and third is not. He won't say third is definitive and second is not. Uh, he won't say that because he basically wants to maintain that you have to understand that in all three turnings, the Buddha is leading us to the same conclusion. But when you stop at a certain point of the journey, and get stuck there, then you might think, oh, this is the destination. And in that sense, you can say, right? Oh, at this part of the journey, if you get stuck there, then that is inferior to uh, this part of the journey if you get stuck here. And then finally, there is a destination. From that perspective, of course, you know, Kyoga Rinpoche recognizes and will say, yes, this is inferior to this, which is inferior to this but only if you get stuck. But if you're not getting stuck and you're on a journey, then whether you are here, you are here, you are here, you are all going to that final destination. So at various points of this journey, you should not think, oh, huh? or, or you should not, you know, more like, you should not like look back at those people that are back there and say, ah, they, they are followers of, you know, some other uh, lower goal. But no, you, you have to understand that they are just at an earlier point on this path. And this path will lead to this one single result over here. Yeah. Maybe that helps. Yeah. So he is not so fuzzy in his thinking yeah, to say this, this, this. Uh, equal in terms of uh, the final, uh, this, this, this are equal uh, in terms of one's progress. Uh, he will say, yes, you progress first here. Uh, first, you are distracted by samsara. You think samsara can give satisfaction and happiness. So you are here. But let me show you the true nature of samsara. Oh, having seen it, now you have moved here. 
Now you are aiming for this wonderful thing called nirvana. But have you now turned nirvana into something substantial, something that you can hang your conceptual coat on, become stuck in? You need to not get stuck in that. Then you need to move here through all the various teachings given about lack of uh, inherent existence. But now, now that you are so well trained in inherent, lack of inherent existence, have you now turned lack of inherent existence into something substantial as well? Oh, emptiness is the final. Emptiness is the most marvelous. Emptiness is really it. Then you need the teachings of the third turning you know, to help you to see emptiness and cause and effect, yeah? a concern that is mostly chiefly highlighted here. In fact, they are two sides of the same coin. Then free from bias, free, free from extreme, you can continue on until yeah? you arrive at the Buddha state. This, you know, Kirpa Rinpoche is not blind to. He is quite aware there is this kind of progression. What he objects to uh, is more this idea that somehow these uh, were given to people who will end up going here. This is given to people who will end up going here. This is given to people who will end up going there. And then this is given to people who will end up finally at the final state. He says, that's, that's wrong view. So in the next statement, it says, huh, which we'll look at next time, it says, but quickly, anything taught as the sixth position is only of the definitive meaning. I want to offer mm, a slightly different reading. It doesn't contradict this um, translation. And I'm offering this not because I know the Tibetan. I have not looked at it right now. But I... I Based on what you know, this statement is about, I think you can also read it as anything taught as the six positions is for, is only for definitive meaning. Not, not off, but for definitive meaning. This reading uh, will emphasize that. Yes, you can analyze all the different statements made by the Buddha in different places, uh, recorded in different sources, uh, and you can establish this uh, kind of organization of like the six positions, and, and we'll look at what these six positions are. Basically, it's um, the position that is considered intentional, non-intentional, provisional, definitive, literal, non-literal. So these six positions are devices uh, that the later banditas, uh, the great think thinkers of, of Indian Buddhism, uh, they came up with this um, organizing principle uh, and say, oh, this statement here is an intentional statement. This statement here is a non-intentional statement. This statement here is a provisional this statement here is definitive. This statement is literal. This statement is non-literal. Here, Kyoba Rinpoche is going to say, yes, you, you can analyze them into these six positions, but do not forget. Every statement that he makes is for leading us to the definitive meaning, and it is off definitive meaning in that that statement was made on the basis of having understood uh, the definitive meaning. So in that sense, it is off definitive meaning and taught to us for leading us to 
definitive meaning. Okay? So off and for, right? you can substitute. Right? And if you will read ahead, right? if you keep this, what I just said, it, it might help right? uh, for the next few pages. Good. Questions, comments? Questions, comments? Question. Yes. Uh, in the view of emptiness, uh, where does karma fit in? What? Wait, what do you mean? <laughs> Because uh, your question doesn't sound like what you're asking. So I am trying to, in emptiness, how does karma fit in? What do you mean? Say more. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I mean is this, the nature of all phenomena that we see is it comes and goes and occurs in space. It's empty of meaning. No, not empty of meaning, empty of essence. Okay. Empty of essence. It has no permanency. Yes. Okay. And the phenomena that we see all around us, it occurs in space, but it comes and goes. It disintegrates. Yes. It has no permanent characteristics. Yes. yes. Okay. The, we are affected as, as sentient beings. We're affected by karma. Yes. So does karma exist in space or is it, like uh, mine. Karma no exists in real... sentient beings. It exists in sentient beings. Yes. Okay. Karma arises. How this emptiness manifests? It manifests according to the principles of cause and effect. This is what we've been talking about the whole time, right from the beginning. She can look, but can look. But is the way in which it plays out. How it plays out, uh, it plays out according to the incontrovertible workings of cause and effect. And, and this point is in contrast to some uh, who hold this same type of teachings, who have this same type uh, in, in Tibetan Buddhism, there are those who say, emptiness trumps everything. In fact, when you understand emptiness, cause and effect, you know, that's all finished now. No need to worry about it. Right? That cause and effect pertains to relative truth in the sense of, now relative has two definitions relative in the sense of deceptive. And therefore, once you are on the other side, you can forget about all this. Jiden Sungun says, no, that's a dangerous position to hold. He says, <clears throat> even in mistaken reality, so to say, even in this dream, cause and effect, is what underlies how things come and go. Things don't come and go without reason. Things don't come and go uh, in a haphazard way. Uh, so as much as you, we, you need to see the illusory nature of everything, the illusory nature of things are still operating according to cause and effect. And the Buddha has seen how cause and effect works, and the Buddha has given so many teachings to point to us uh, all the details of cause and effect. And here, according, especially in the Gongchik tradition, it seems like the preference for us to learn about how cause and effect works uh, is to give us stories. So Sobish points out that in the Rinjama and Dorshema commentaries, uh, it comes with a lot of stories uh, in the form of an appendix. Uh, where Buddha says, if you want to understand this, you know, look at that story. Oh, then that story, you know. Uh, often these stories are past lives of Buddhas. 
some of the life stories pertaining to the Mahasiddhas, and in some rare cases, some stories about Tibetan great masters. Uh, but mostly it's about the Jataka tales of the Buddha. So Buddha says, you know, as much as this is confused existence, don't say, you know, and don't think, oh, confused existence, doesn't matter what the heck you do, because it's all confused. That is what we say nihilism is. So I see today, you know, like some Buddhist teachers, you know, some very actually brilliant, you know, like I'm inspired by their teachings. But when they go in the direction of like, ultimately, 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 you know, whenever they start a statement with ultimately, ultimately, this is all just an illusion. Ultimately, this is, that's when, you know, my gong chick side will like kind of like, uh. because that's like we're saying, why, why, why do you need to, uh, all this talk about ultimate. In fact, ultimate is not a domain for talking. Yeah. Ultimate cannot be touched by words. So then all the words that you spend talking about ultimate might actually uh, cause you to forget cause and effect. Very dangerous. <laughs> so Nagarjuna says, you know, when you misapply the teachings of emptiness is more dangerous like then you know blindly grabbing cobras if you are a snake handler yeah you can catch cobras effectively but if you're not a snake handler grabbing a cobra will kill you Yeah, good. Yes. Good. Larry is instigating this question eh, so that we can be reminded of the relationship between emptiness and cause and effect. So I'm like, wait, why are you asking this question? So it's good to plant questions, just like televangelists will plant miracles, you know. Here uh, in our tradition, you know, we don't do that kind of unethical things, huh? but it's okay to plant questions <laughs> so that it will st stir up, you know, an occasion to go back to remembering. What are we talking about when we talk about emptiness and cause and effect being huh? non-dual? Sometimes the language of non-dual makes things so fuzzy. And, and sometimes it's because we're exhausted, you know, so we love saying, Oh, emptiness and cause and effect, non-dual. Then we hear that, then we just fuzzy. Mm, yes, non-dual, everything is one. <laughs> non-dual, huh? main thing we have to understand when we say emptiness and cause and effect is non-dual is they do not contradict each other. The implications, when you fully understand, as Judy was saying, when you fully and correctly understand emptiness, you will see cause and effect crystal clear. When you fully and truly understand cause and effect, you will see the truth of emptiness crystal clear. They are non-dual in that way. Chang Chu Sem Chu Rin Ma ke pa nam ke gyu chi Ke pa nyam pa me pa ya Gong ne gong du Pil shu So see you Sunday if you're attending the